am a full-time voice talent, producer, and also host of the Beal Boss podcast. And I have sent, spent probably the last two years uh, diligently researching and educating myself in the AI industry and synthetic voices, as well as, in, as, well as interviewing multiple companies on synthetic voices and production and ethics. So I'm so excited for us to talk today because as I needed to be educated about this industry, I'm hoping that our panel discussion can also help to inform you about voice acting and, and our industry so that we can effectively work together. So with that said, I'm excited to introduce my esteemed colleagues on the panel. Uh, beside me, I have Dr. Rupal Patel, VP of Voice and Accessibility for Baritone. Rupal is responsible for setting strategy and leading innovation efforts in the voice AI space. Um, she is also uh, expanding the reach of Veritone's voice, voice solutions for those living with disabilities or inequities. And uh, she's got a great talk coming up at about four o'clock today. Um, next to Rupal, we have Jim Canelli, owner of Lotus Productions in New York City. Lotus is committed to a vision of a new voice economy and building the capabilities, technological and human, that let you achieve it. I love that. Uh, next to Jim, we have Rob Stiglin-Paglia, actor, voice actor, and attorney, best known in our industry for all things voiceover legal, um, but for you, probably best known as uh, the lawyer that helped to settle the case for Bev Stanning and TikTok. Uh, next to Rob, we have Jody Krangle, full-time voice actor for over 15 years for major brands, including Dell, BBVA, and Kraft, and host of the popular audio branding podcast. So. Thank you guys for joining me. So I think before we can have a productive discussion on how we can work together, I think it helps to start um, by talking about how voice actors acquire jobs. So I'd like to start with Jody. If you could talk about typically what does a voice actor do today to acquire and negotiate voice acting jobs? It depends a lot on um, where they're getting this from. So they could get it from an agent. They could get it from someone approaching them directly through their website, or they could do some direct marketing themselves and end up talking to people for whatever they were hoping to sell their services for, right. you know? Um, and yeah, there's a, a lot that goes into that. So um, it's, it's more of a licensing thing than it is a commodity, let's say. Mm -hmm. So we license our voices based on where it'll be heard, how long it'll be heard, and how many people will hear it. So in, in, it, it can get a little complicated, but, uh, but it's a lot like music licensing in that way. Mm -hmm. so. And also, I would say, depending on the genre, whether it's broadcast or non-broadcast, yes. there are differences. Yeah, definitely. So broadcast, obviously, if it's broadcast, it's going to be heard and seen by way more people. So when it comes to corporate narration, for instance, and non-broadcast, mm -hmm. e-learning, that kind of stuff, it's very specific to a group. And so, you know, it could be on the company website or it could be internally for training, um, all sorts of different reasons. And you'd have a different um, schedule of payments, to, you know, depending on which it was. Jim, you work with casting voice actors on a daily basis yep. as well as production uh, for companies all over the world. What are the important qualities of a voice, human or synthetic, that your clients are looking for? What they're looking for? Uh, Voice overcasting nowadays is very vertical. It's drilled down, it's very personalized. We also talk about diversity, because diversity creates better ideas. So our casting always involves a lot of diversity. And uh, authenticity. So those are the four key points when companies come to us around the world or when we're looking at talent around the world that we want to work with, either as a live actor or make a synthetic version of their voice. Those are the four qualities we always look for. And that's what a younger generation of producers the designers and developers, or younger people here today, uh, are looking for. That they know that's what, when we market to ourselves in the future, particularly to younger people, that's what they're gonna be looking for and listening for. So Rupal, you have extensive experience in creating synthetic voices. Um, talk about what qualities make for a great synthetic voice, and is a voice actor required? <laughs> yes, a voice actor is required, or a human is required to create a synthetic voice. You start with, recordings, um, and those recordings are then used to generate the voice model. Um, and the reason a voice actor is important in terms of creating a good synthetic voice for commercial or enterprise use cases is because the way that the speech will be delivered or articulated during the actual recording period, the training data, um, 
voice talent know how to do this. This is their job. This is your job. Um, and it also means that um, it will take less time to do those recordings than if you asked someone who doesn't do this on a regular basis to read. Because as we know that even though we're all fluent and we can read, um, reading um, something right in front of you as it's written, even if there are spelling mistakes in it, even if there's grammatical errors in it, it you have to kind of untrain your brain to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, we find that sometimes, I mean, we've made voices for people who are not voice talent, and we've actually crowdsourced voices from everyday people. Uh, the problem with that is that they often don't know how to speak into a microphone. They often don't necessarily know that they have to turn background noise off and so on. With the voice talent, you don't have to do any of that. It's all, they all know, they know that. Um, so for enterprise use cases, you wanna start off with someone who actually knows how to not only speak, but also act so that we can get the right kind of audio. So Rob, as a voice actor and an entertainment attorney, you've been negotiating contracts for, for us, for me, as well as probably multiple people on this panel for years. Um, what are the primary considerations that voice actor, that every actor should be concerned with uh, in terms of licensing and usage of their voice? So it's the same really for whether it's a live or synthetic voice. Mm -hmm. And as Jody mentioned, it's really licensing. So the voice actor wants to know Desperately, <laughs> how is my voice going to be used? How long? Where? You know, especially because there's conflicts. So, um, voice actors, for instance, could be the voice of Coke, Coca-Cola, and so then they're trans, they're contractually not allowed to do competitors, Pepsi. So, with synthetic voice, that's that's an issue that has to get addressed in the contract. Where if it's a third party who's using the synthetic voice, that the voice actor has to be aware for one of those reasons. But really it's for licensing. It's, it's to figure out where the voice is gonna be heard, who's gonna use it, for how long. So that's the main concern for the contracts. So does that, so would you consider then uh, contracts need, would need to be negotiated per, on, a, on a per job basis or like to be truly effective? Uh, per, I would say not, well, if you have access to the third party, that'd be, that's great. And that's mm -hmm. one of the provisions I'd wanna put in the main contract. But the main contracts, the one with the one where you're, the talent is doing the synthetic voice, recording the voice for the AI company, all that has to be spelled out in there. And you don't necessarily have to do new contracts each time it's used, but you want it done at least, you have the right to do that in the main contract. So that's the most important one, the main contract. The other issue that comes up, and that, that's a, a concern um, for the synthetic AI voice world, is what's gonna happen if the company who you did your initial recordings for mm -hmm. doesn't use you anymore or you wanna leave? What happens to the files? Do they get to keep them? Do they get destroyed? Do you get to keep your voice, <laughs> your own synthetic voice? So that's another issue that has to be addressed in the contract mm -hmm. because otherwise you might wanna switch companies, say, or sure. use the voice yourself. And you're, if you're contractually not allowed to do that, you know, your, your files are gonna be sitting there somewhere and they, right. could, they could get hacked. You know, many things can happen. So. And I think also very familiar you are with the, what happened with Bev after the company, I guess, went out of business or, and then her voice got sold. Right. Um, so that would be another concern. And then also um, uh, the content, right? How, how is it that we can specify what content our voices, our synthetic voices would be speaking? Right. That, well, that's another term that uh, that's similar to a live voice versus synthetic voice. Mm -hmm. You want to put in your contract. For instance, that if you don't want your uh, your voice used for pornographic material or for certain religious or political material, you know that would be something you put in your contract. Same thing with you know same thing with when you're doing your AI voice that you don't want the end user to use it for those those things. So I'm going to throw the question out. We've kind of already breached a little bit about what what it is that uh, voice actors might be fearful of with synthetic voices. But for all of you, um, what are the biggest concerns and fears that you've heard from voice actors regarding synthetic voices? Well, a lot of people say that it'll take their jobs, right? Yeah. Like they're afraid that it'll compete with the jobs they're doing. So my answer to that actually is put it in your contract. Because um, generally the work that I do is five minutes of finished audio or less. So I really pretty much tailored my business to do that. And in order to uh, make sure that the synthetic voice that I created wasn't competing with that, I basically said, okay, so it can't do commercial, it can't do corporate narration that's less than five minutes, 
um, you know, anything that's less than five minutes, I'm doing myself. Otherwise, it's in the contract that can be used, you know, besides the usual, I don't want it used for hate speech or, mm. or you know, um, pornographic material or anything like that, right? So, um, other, you can put it in the contract. I other think, fears, yeah, that you heard. I think the big fear is uh, education. We just don't know enough. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, why we're here today. And uh, what we talk about when we're on your podcast or Jody's podcast, mm -hmm. that it's, it's a moment for talents who are independent artists to start to learn about a new industry because this industry is here. It's coming. It's how we're going to market to one another. And so they need to just take the time now to get to know the developers, the designers, understand their language, the language that they work in. And we're here also, obviously, today to help you understand our language. This is the voiceover industry. It's a very established industry, been around since radio in the 20s and 30s. Uh, there's a lot of professionals in it who are interested in designing developers and AI. So it's a moment about education. That's the thing we talk about mainly. Absolutely, I agree with that. I also think that um, I'd say in the last three years, there's been a major change. So back in 2019, mm -hmm. where Jim and I first met, um, you know, there was a lot more fear. And there's a lot less understanding and a lot less sort of awareness of A, what it took to make a voice, B, you know, what kinds of provisions there could be to how your voice could be used, um, all the different sort of watermarking technology and everything that we're doing to protect the voices. Ryan talked this morning about, you know, your voice and name and likeness. And so there's a lot of things that can be done um, to protect the end user, um, or not the end user, sorry, the voice talent. And for voice talent, I think the turn from seeing it as fear to opportunity, mm -hmm. I think is, is starting partly your, your podcast, I think got a lot of people even thinking about it because mm -hmm. they were just sort of like arms distance away. A lot of voice talent didn't want to talk that they, about the fact that they were making their synthetic voice. I remember you and I talking yeah. about that because it felt that like maybe many conversations. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And so it was like, well, my colleagues will know that I'm making a synthetic voice and I'm sort of doing something bad behind mm -hmm. their back, you know? And I don't think that that is so much the case anymore, mm -hmm. um, but it's really an opportunity. It's an opportunity to be somewhere 24 seven, right? Yeah. And I don't think that the competitor to your AI voice is that job that's gonna take your AI voice. It's actually Fiverr, right? Or like it's, it's the other, it's the gig economy kind of things because your AI voice is an extension of you. Mm -hmm. meaning you are still actually monetizing on it. But when someone else takes your job that can, you can pay less to, that is income you are never going to see. So I think when we start turn this from fear to opportunity is, the, is mm -hmm. really um, something where we can see today, I think. Yeah. And yeah. you've led right into my next question is, what, you know, what can we communicate to voice actors? And, and as well as for the, the, the community here, the synthetic voice providers, to encourage voice actors to want to produce a synthetic voice and use a voice and, and evolve. Well, that, that contracts exist that, uh, you know, whether it's equity or sag after is here today, it's fantastic. Uh, they're here to understand just like we all are. All are. They're here to start to build contracts. Veritone spoke, spoke about contracts today. Uh, so voice talents should know that there are people, the Open Voice Network is here, yes. and this is what we do. We talk about, we share information about the contracts we're working on with individual talents, with talent managers, with agents, and with global production companies. We share all the information of what are you paying people, what kind of contract are you using, what stipulations did you put in the contract. So people should know that these conversations for a number of years now, three, four, five years, we've been working on this, are open and they're happening. Yeah, and I, I love that you said that, and I, I really appreciated, you know, Veritone's stance, Ryan talking this morning about, um, you know, protection um, of, of, our, of our voice and licensing, and that is, I think, sends a big message to our community as well as, as your community and lessens the fear uh, for voice talent. So I, I'm, I'm really encouraged myself about that, and I also think, you know, try and get, trying to get word out through, you know, podcasts and as well as having encouraging, um, you know, jobs that we've completed, you know, with our voice um, and kind of spreading that word out to the community, I think will, will really help. Um, so now the next question I have is how do we, how do we market these voices and whose responsibility is it to market these voices? Because right now as voice actors, uh, we either have a talent agent that's going out there and, you know, giving us auditions. There's maybe uh, online casting sites where we're getting auditions or we're direct marketing ourselves. But for our synthetic voices, now we are partnering. 
And so how are we going to, or how or who, um, I think we have to work together to market. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, I mean, I could say, uh, talk about the contract that we have with Beyond Words. Myself and Adam Lafon did a, uh, a test. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, we did a test with Beyond Words and uh, we came up with a contract with them, um, which I know that all of you looked over. Uh, and we, uh, we are kind of relying on them to market it to the people that they are able to market to. So a lot of the times they're marketing it to large uh, publishers, basically mm -hmm. for websites so that they'll read out articles and such. And if your voice is chosen to be the voice of, let's say, the New York Times, then that's however many millions of characters and you get paid per millions of characters. So, you know, it just depends. And the contracts, I'm sure, will be different as time passes. But this was a test for a, a year contract. And it seems to be going okay. I mean, we, you know, we're still early on in it. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, and I think that that's actually, from what I've seen from clients that have come in and wanted contracts reviewed and myself personally, the marketing part is the big question yeah. part. Like, because it's hard to even foresee mm -hmm. protections in a contract. Right. Like, well, you don't know how, you know, really going to know how the voice is being used in the end because, you know, the, the business models aren't there yet where they're, you know, the companies are still experimenting on how they're going to use sure. the synthetic voices. So that's the exciting part for me, though, mm -hmm. to see where that goes because, you know, there's so many different potential uses that they're, they're untapped right now. And I think that talent agents even can get involved like the old model of talent mm -hmm. agents looking for work for their talent, you know, they could be booking their talent synthetic voice. I think that's yeah. a possibility. Yeah. So I, I think that's, you know, that's the part that is very exciting for me. Mm -hmm. Right. We always say the next 10 years are going to be super exciting in this business. Uh, I agree with Robert. Well, as a, someone who represents talents, we have an audio production company. We create voices. We also don't want to limit someone like Veritel. We want them to go crazy, like go, like market these voices. Mm -hmm. And then at a point, okay, we'll have a contract, we'll work out, we'll find exactly the right voice you need to help your clients. So we also don't want to restrict you guys. We want to see you guys take off and whether it's Veritone, Respeacher, companies like this, we want to support them underneath with the talent like yourself uh, and with our expertise as audio experts. So I think it's going to be really next 10 years, it's going to be amazing. I think it's actually an investment on both the producer of the AI voice as well as the talent. So if you want your voice, your natural voice to be marketed, you market it, right? Um, so I think right now sort of relying on the AI companies to say, well, you go market the synthetic voice um, and, sort of I'll, and I'll benefit if you market it. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a joint proposition here, right? If, and we also have to have this sort of acceptance that the synthetic voice is that extension and so you are benefiting from it. So it isn't sort of like, I'll let you use it kind of when I feel like it, because that sort of, there's, there's a friction there. And that friction is what creates the barrier to actually monetizing on this for both sides. Um, I also think there should be really clear lines about how your voice gets used and, and people, talent, you have to have that word as well. But both sides have to be looked at with equal fairness, I think. And I think you have to think about the fact that this company is invested in creating your voice. They're obviously invested in monetizing. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're not trying to deliberately do something that violates your interests. And so there's that trust needs to be built from that beginning. Um, and that means also, though, you have the capability of going out and using that voice for these new use cases that come up um, so that there isn't a constant friction, because I think that constant friction is what is we've been stuck in glue. Mm -hmm. when it comes to synthetic voice monetization. We've been stuck. Mm -hmm. Both feet, you know, what you take a step forward and you've got this glue stuck on your foot still. You know, like I think it's, there's a problem because while there have been some people experimenting, it's clearly still experimenting in terms of the talent. And, you know, but you can't use it for this, you can't use it for that. Um, and then the company sort of hedges, you know, and says, okay, we can't do this. And so I feel like we are in this kind of, quick, you know, just stuck in this land where we're not taking this big mm -hmm. leap forward. The advancement, I think, today, what we were talking about with Stats Perform, and I think there's going to be some, that's a, it's a very specific use case, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you can imagine, yes, I understand, you can get worried about, is my voice going to get used to say things I don't believe in? But when you have specific carved out use cases, 
you know, you have to be able to say, okay, yeah, yeah. Go, go do that, monetize my voice in this way, include diversity of voices and so on and so forth, regionalize voices and so on. So I, maybe there's ways to have some middle ground where as long as there's shared trust between the companies you're working with and the organization and the, the, the sag after as well as the talent themselves, I think we can move. Without that shared trust or without sort of those anchors in there, I think it's going to be hard to actually, you're going to keep saying mm -hmm. 10 years right. for a lot of 10 years, yeah. for 10 more years. Yes. <laughs> yeah, trust, trust will come from success stories. Yeah. Well, that's what we're yeah. interested in. We're interested in being part of success stories. Yeah. Absolutely. I think, I think really trust is everything because I think from our perspective and, and voice acting land, um, we trust our agents or we trust ourselves to make those negotiations. And now, um, and, and we're one step removed, right? Normally we are in our studios creating the product and we are delivering that product ourselves. And now this is not going to be the case. And I think a lot of um, actors in the industry, in the voice industry, don't kind of, they, they, don't, they don't understand that remove, that one step removed yet because, and they don't understand why it's a, why it could be, let's say a revenue share, right? Because the voice does not, they just don't know that the voice obviously does not get generated in your studio unless, you know, I don't know, you have some sort of you not, know, really, really nice arrangement with a company, but it's, you know, it's just one of those things. So I think that's where a lot of the fear comes from because it's one step removed and it's no longer under their control to produce that audio. So that's my, my take. Yeah, you're not, it. you're not using the script. So yeah. you're not seeing yep. the script that's going to be used, but at least in certain use cases, you know, generally what that script is going to be. And that should be as long as it's not violating all of your other, you know, mm -hmm. conflicts and things like that. Um, yeah. I, I think it's also the fear of the unknown, really, yes. because yeah. that's why I'm being cautious doing contracts because, because I don't know. As soon as you see one of the companies come out and say, okay, we're doing audiobooks now, you'll see, you'll see a line of voice talent out the door <laughs> doing their synthetic voices to get, to get, their, you know, get their audiobooks recorded and paid. That's not, there's no clear market yet. So that's the reason why everyone's kind of cautious. It's unknown. So once that becomes more known, then I think a lot of the issues are just gonna, they'll iron themselves out and resolve themselves. Yeah. And, and I think, I, you know, I'm just gonna kind of bring up this up, which is possibly the taboo, is, is all about the value in terms of, you know, companies have synthetic voice products, which, you know, is, it's, it's an asset. And so for voice actors, our voice is our asset. And because it's so personal, um, we get very personal when we feel that that's being possibly taken away or devalued. And so I think in terms of when working together, you know, a voice actor with, with a company to produce a voice and maybe market that voice, um, I, I think understanding that, that there, the value is appreciated is very much appreciated by voice actors. That's my thought <laughs> on that. So I, I want to say that I'm very proud to, to be a part of uh, and, and Jody, I know, and all of us being a part of this kind of what I consider the grassroots of the voice actors, getting out there and making things work effectively. I'd like to, um, and also being part of the Open Voice Network, the Synthetic Voice Study Group, that's been amazing. Um, yeah, I absolutely am so honored and, and happy that that's there. And I'm happy for the support of all, you know, the companies out there that have been working with us. So I, I'd like to talk to um, all of you guys and say, what do you think we can do uh, moving forward to work more effectively together. Just open lines of communication. I mean, we just make, we need to talk. Yeah. I mean, that's really what it what it's all about. We just need to um, educate each other on yeah. how we see things, and then see where that comes together to make a profitable whole. <laughs> we want to see some real test cases. We want to yeah. build voices and help that you can market and be successful with. That's what we want. Like, well, we want that this quarter, next quarter. Let's make it happen in 2023. Let's, let's, let's work together. Because the voices are there. We can be specific. We can be really, really zip code it right into where you want it to be. Short bursts of information, six, eight seconds. Mm -hmm. Be great. Because yeah. people will get turned, people will be turned on once they see it work. Rob, anything mm -hmm. on the legal end of things that can help? you know, move forward faster or more productively well, together? Yeah. I mean, I've spoken to a lot of the the, uh, the people that are in charge <laughs> mm -hmm. writing the contracts of the ad right. companies because, you know, voice talent will come in and I'll have questions. We'll send our changes over and that, that will be somebody who'll get on the phone with me and we'll talk about it. So I kind of understand both sides. Mm -hmm. 
So it really is the fear of the talent not knowing where their their voice is going to go, and the AI company wanting to explore. You know, one thousand percent, we want to do is here, here, and here, mm -hmm. and that's where you have to get the happy medium. You have to get them to me in the middle. You know, give enough flexibility in the contract, but still protect the, the, the voice actor. So that's always the that's always the, the balancing point and the, the challenge. So I, I think for most of the companies so far, you know, they've they've all been all the ones I've spoken to. They've mm -hmm. all, all been open to flexible language in the contract, mm -hmm. protecting the voice actors. You know, open dialogue. So you know, if it if it continues along that path and as things start to move forward and as they start to develop their markets, you know, I think I think it'll be it'll be beneficial for everybody, mm -hmm. back voice actors and AI. But you know, I can definitely see things going different paths too. Yeah. So hopefully it stays that way. But you know, uh, things can go off, and you know, the voice can be used for for bad, illegal things yeah. as well. So yeah, and I, I think that's that's also another another concern is you know data protection in terms of what you know how is this being addressed in terms of hybrid voices um, how is our voice protected and well right now uh, <laughs> to be quite honest as a voice actor if our voice is used outside of the scope of the contract that we've negotiated for example if you know I've done a commercial that was supposed to air regionally on the east coast and then it somehow it, it appears in you know California on food network i don't know <laughs> that that voice has been used unless somebody tells me and so i'm actually excited for you know this because I feel like there's I, I understand that there's watermarking that are, is now available um, so that you can kind of track or at least you understand where our voice is if it's been made into a hybrid or you know I don't know maybe you can expand a little more on that with all yeah so a watermark essentially is just um, kind of like having an invisible stamp right on the on the audio wave it's it's not audible um, but it just all it tells you is who made this voice and, and it sort of tells you whether I mean in that way you tells you whether it's synthetic or not, right? But you still have to have something beyond just the watermark to then differentiate whether it's made by baritone or made by what whoever else, right? Um, and so I think at some point, there's going to have to be some kind of a registry of the voices and some way to kind of uh, like a blockchain of, of really managing how these voices are used and where they're being used and the permissioning. In fact, I think it's going to be better than what we have today. A lot of the yeah. processes we have today are very manual um, and they're sort of like, oh, I heard your voice over there and it shouldn't have been over there. It's mm -hmm. past six months, you know. Um, it's When it's digital, we have the capability of measuring this in, in many different ways. And so I think there's going to be a lot more, I think, advances even to the regular voiceover yeah. uh, industry. But, I, you know, going back to your other question, though, um, I would like to stop hearing about what are you fearing yeah. about synthetic voice. <laughs> I hate the word synthetic voice because it, it feels like to everyone like it's polyester, um, and it's itchy, and it's something. Yeah. There's something wrong with it. There's something inferior about it. Um, you know, when Ryan played those two samples this morning, nobody in that room thought that they were um, that they were synthetically yeah. created because people's imagination of what synthetic is dates back 20, 30 years ago to when it sounded clearly synthetic, mm -hmm. robotic. Today, when they tell you that, oh, I think it's something robotic, usually it's in their head. <laughs> because synthetic voice today is far beyond what it yeah. used to be. And so I think for many of you in this room who actually have created your own synthetic voice, um, whatever it is today in 2022, it's going to be that much better in 2023 and in 2024 and in 2025 and so on and so forth. This field is accelerating beyond belief. Right? And so I think the thing is, let's stop talking about the fear and let's start thinking about what those opportunities are and actually go in there with an open mind because, all right, so this analogy I heard before is like, if you're really hanging on to like a set of little pencils that you grab or whatever as a little kid, um, if you open your hand just a little bit bigger, you can actually fit more pencils in there. There's an opportunity here for us to actually go after something way beyond. Yeah. You cannot work mm -hmm. 24 hours a day. You don't want to be working 24 hours a day. But if your AI voice can work for you while you're sleeping, yeah. while you're on vacation and doing all these other things, you're actually making money as well. Mm -hmm. And you also have to be realistic about the fact that your AI voice is not just your recordings. There's IP and technology that went into making that voice. So this, these AI companies, 
AI companies, <laughs> we are not taking your voice and recreating it and then just going selling it off to different people, yeah. right? There's IP that goes into creating that, to maintaining that, to running that. That is what we are investing in. You have invested in your voice. We protect that and we want to honor that. But you also have to honor what we are putting into it in terms of changing it. We are not just taking your recordings and then replaying them somewhere else. That's not this business. So you have to think about it differently than you were thinking about your old business where you were recording and those recordings were just being played on the air in different places, added music and so on. That's not what's happening in this case. It is a computational model where we're fixing things, we're constantly evolving this technology. So that second piece of it needs to also be understood so that people understand the rights of, when I hear things like voice talent own the models, no, that can't. Voice talent own their recordings. They don't own the models because that IP mm -hmm. is the technology company who created that voice model. So we just have to have fair field open discussions about this rather than kind of pretending to be in the field but not necessarily wanting all yeah. of that. Yeah, and you don't need to be a designer or developer if you're a voice talent to understand this. You just have to be able to open yourself up to this new conversation yes. and recreate your business. Much agreed, and and I, you know, as for you know, on behalf of the community, I mean, on behalf of the, I, mean, I, I, you know, and on this panel, I mean, um, we're, I'm very happy to work with any companies to help evolve this further, so that we can open the discussions, have more discussions, and just work together to evolve, um, and make this an amazing, an amazing next year, or next two years um, by working together. So. Uh, at this point, I'd like to open up the, the floor if anybody has any questions for the panel. Terry, how can we help you? <laughs> I'm Terry Nicole, I'm a voice actor and entertainer, voice creator. And I just was thinking of something you just said, you know, about people recreating their businesses. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I try to do is share my journey of creating my AI voice with the voiceover community to kind of take away the fear and the, like, what is it? Um, is, there, is there a cost to voice talent who do not start to have the conversation and open up their minds to think about how to recreate their business that they may be dealing with five, eight, 10 years down the, down the line? Uh, as someone who works with voice talent and cast voice talent, yeah, I think you could be missing the boat if you don't get involved. Uh, and that also goes out to obviously the union. It goes out to talent agents, talent managers. We always suggest to, uh, to talent agents that you should get younger people into your companies who understand AI, who can negotiate contracts, who understand talent. So uh, yeah, I think this is a moment to recreate your business and, and find success because you did learn and then rebuild yourself. Anyone else? Well. Thank you, Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Anne.